have my theories, but anyway, we won't go into my fantasies. <laughs> so when you're talking about folic acid, and you compare that to giving somebody folic acid versus giving them the active form of folic acid, you have to take a whole bunch of folic acid in order to make the amount of active form of folic acid that you would get if you just took the active form of folic acid. And so it's much more efficient to take that. The other problem is, is that you've got to get it into the parts of the body where it needs to go. So one of the problems, and this is, I, I was talking to a group of chemists and they said, well, if you're only making it at 10%, you just 10 times the dose and you'll be fine. The problem with that is that the folic acid blocks your ability for the active form of folic acid to get into the brain. So if you've got regular folic acid at high levels, what little methylfolate you make can't get into the brain. So you're better off to get it into where it needs to go, into the cells and into the brain, you need to take it in its active form. So what happens if you have low methylfolate? Well, you don't make serotonin, dopamine, or epinephrine, and those are all of the um, neurotransmitters that are associated with depression. So when we treat depression, we're treating the symptoms of low levels. We're not, for the most part, doing anything to raise those levels back up. This actually raises the levels back up if we give this form of folic acid. Well, it also has low glutathione. Well, what's glutathione? That's not one that's as, as common or, or commonly discussed as the serotonin. But glutathione, they've found if your glutathione level's low, your memory is poor. If your glutathione levels are high, your memory is high. Why? Well, we don't know that, but we do know what glutathione does. It's a very powerful antioxidant, and it clears all of your heavy metal and the plastic stuff, the BPA. So we're all exposed to the BPA because it's everywhere. And BPA blocks your ability to make the glutathione, and so you get into this vicious cycle. You can't clear the BPA because you can't make the glutathione because you can't make the methylfolate, and then the BPA blocks you to, from making even more methylfolate, and so it, it gets into this vicious downward spiral. The other thing is that this enzyme is one of the few enzymes in the body that's a two-reaction enzyme. It does two things instead of just one. Most enzymes in the body just do one thing. This makes methylfolate, and it makes something called tetrahydrobiopterin. Now, that's a common word, right? Y'all know that. <laughs> well, they abbreviate a BH4 because, for some reason, people have trouble remembering tetrahydrobiopterin. Well, that's needed for nerve protection, so it protects your nerves against environmental toxins. Parkinson's, for example, do you know how they get rats to test for Parkinson's disease? They give them a single dose of a, neuro, of a uh, pesticide, and then they, all of the rats have Parkinson's. Now they can test their new drug to treat the Parkinson's. But my contention is, is if we can protect the nerves, we're able to help some of these things. They actually have done studies where they give IV glutathione to people with Parkinson's and it resolves the Parkinson's for a day or two and then it goes away and then it comes right back. So it doesn't solve it, but there's at least some <coughs> interaction there. So next slide. So if you have then the methylfolate low and then you get these environmental toxicities, what does it cause? Well, heavy metals. Where do we get heavy metals? <coughs> Everywhere. Arsenic. Um, is arsenic in the water? 
Sure. It's at low levels, but it is in the water. And um, mercury is in our, some of our fillings. And if we, if you have a low level exposure and can get rid of it, it's not a problem. But people who are sick, they exclude from those studies. So people who can't clear those toxins then end up with a lot more symptoms. So it, you get heavy metal buildup. The other thing is that some of the medications we use cause problems with our ability to make methylfolate. Diabetic medication, metformin or glucophage. Birth control pills. Nobody ever takes those, right? What they've actually come out with now is that there are two birth control pills that have this form of folic acid in them for this very reason. It's starting to be recognized that, hey, this is a problem. Now, do you need to go out and get those pills? No, you can just get the vitamin and take with it. But they at least are recognizing now that's a problem and using it. And I mentioned that there are other gene defects that are associated with this. So um, if you've got several of them in a row, you can be in real trouble. I went home when I got my testing, and my son at the time was 17, reading the book, and the table, and I said, Wesley, I want you to know I'm defective. <laughs> he looks up and he goes, well, yeah. <laughs> the sad part is this means you're defective. <laughs> Kids are great for entertainment. I mentioned the BPA and some of the other organic toxins build up. In fact, there's been some recent studies showing that in people who lose weight, and especially lose lots of weight, their organic toxins in their bloodstream skyrocket. And if they can't clear them, what does it do? It makes them put that right back on because the only other place it can go is your nerves. So it's the one model now that has been postulated, and this came out uh, summer and fall of last year, that explains the set point theory that we've seen over the last 30, 40 years. So what does heavy metals do? Well, first of all, we've known for centuries that Mercury is a problem, right? What make, made the Mad Hatter mad? Mercury. So we've known that mercury caused um, problems with depression. Where does mercury work? Where does mercury block? It blocks methionine synthase, the step right after MDHFR. Well, these are a list of some of the symptoms that are associated with it. So one of the models for fibromyalgia is this idea of genetically not able to clear environmental toxins. And so when we first started seeing fibromyalgia, it was almost exclusively in their 60-plus-year-old folks. Now we're seeing it. I've seen that somebody that met all of the criteria for fibromyalgia in their late 20s. So, the, and the environmental toxin load is um, much higher today. I mean, 40 years ago, how many of you drank water out of a water bottle? Um, not many. Some of you didn't even live then. So, all right. But, you can see there's just a lot of these symptoms that are associated <laughs> with this kind of problem. Um, so is it your problem? I don't know. But what I'm saying is, is that if we can correct the pathway and get your body to be able to clear some of this stuff, then we can actually <coughs> really improve the symptoms in a lot of folks. Environmental concerns. I mentioned that uh, there's been some interesting studies. They did a study in India looking at low levels of arsenic. So these are not the levels that they say, oh, this is toxic. This is the, ah, uh, yeah, it's below the EPA guidelines and, and so we're fine. 
They looked at low-level arsenic exposure and increased the risk of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure fourfold. So in the United States, we look at that data and go, yeah, that's it again. So they repeated the study in Bangladesh. Yeah, that's Bangladesh. So then they repeated the study in the United States and showed a fourfold increase in diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure. So they also looked at BPA. What does BPA do? I mean, we know it blocks this same pathway. It causes increase in diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure. It also has this unique ability to um, screw up estrogen and testosterone. So one of the things that we now know is that BPA is associated with the polycystic <coughs> ovary uh, problems as well as uh, endometriosis and may also affect testosterone levels as well. So they did this study and they looked at, you know, in the United States we've had a fourfold increase in diabetes over the last decade and, and that's a problem. And so they looked at Asia. In the United States, we blame that on two things, right? McDonald's and Nintendo. Poor diet, lack of exercise. But in Asia, they have seen a somewhere in the neighborhood of two to tenfold increase in diabetes over the same period of time. Well, Bangladesh, they have a McDonald's on every corner and a Nintendo in every house, right? Um, probably not so much. What they've found is that in Asia, they've had no increase in their BMI. They've had no weight increase, but still have had the same diabetic um, increase that we've seen in the U.S. So one of the things that came out of this article is maybe our model's wrong. Um, we don't like it in medicine when somebody says our model is wrong, but that's the way it goes. So we, and they did mention that it was associated with that one of the concerns and one of the things we needed to look at was this arsenic studies and the organic toxin study. 